this is a talk about endings and beginnings. CEO of Magnify.net. And on September 10th, 2001, I was a filmmaker. As a filmmaker, we tell stories. We record the world. We project our stories to the world. And it had been a very good gig. But on September 11th, I became a curator. And in thinking about this talk and trying to explain to you how the world has changed in the last 10 years, I struggled with the way to tell you in words about the film I made and how I made it. And I decided instead it would be easier to show you a brief portion of it. So here is just a brief portion of Seven Days in September. inside me. One horrified, the other one fascinated. We wanted it to stay there, and we wanted it to be a memento, like the brother without a sister. But we kind of had an idea that the second one would crash, too. It was a matter of time. And I guess everyone stuck around for that. So those words haunted me, a brother without a sister. Beautiful, poetic, meaningful, memorable words. And what I learned on September 11th was that the story of that day, and many of the stories we now tell each other in the world in which we're all empowered with technology, is better told not by filmmakers telling a story, but instead by gathering material, organizing it, and essentially curating that story. Now, a lot has changed in those 10 years, as you know. One of the things that I found in the 10 years post 9-11 was that increasingly the mainstream media's ability to tell the story was getting overwhelmed by all of us. I think that's a good thing, because what we see now ending is the era of the me web, the era where we go to the web to get our airplane ticket or put our thing there, and we all kind of interact with it independently. And what we're seeing emerge today is the era of the WeWeb. Come on, sorry. And the WeWeb is something that we all participate in. All 600 of us in the theater today, all of us watching online, all of us will watch this talk in the days and months to follow. Now, this is a good thing, but it also is daunting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that's changing the way we behave. So this is a quote that you may have heard. From the beginning of time until 2008, we created five exabytes of data. That includes war and peace, it includes your phone book, it includes the Bible, all the information. We're now creating that much information every two days. Now, that is a good thing, but it's also pretty overwhelming. <laughs> Take this haystack, imagine the information you're looking for is a needle, now to multiply the haystack by 10 billion and make the needle smaller. The problem gets bigger and bigger. So, if I can, I just want to ask a question of the folks here today. We have 600 people in the theater. Think about this. In the last couple of days, I'm just going to ask, raise your hand if the last thing you did at the end of the day, after you kissed your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife, walked the dog, put your kids to bed, did the homework, shut off the TV, the last thing you did was check your email. Raise your hand. <laughs> All right. So little... OK, next question, a little harder. You wake up the next day. <laughs> Before you've had a cup of coffee, you check your email. Yeah. I think, and this is the bonus points question. How many of you wake up in the middle of the night and check your email? <laughs> now, here's what's funny about that. What's funny about that is we all think that we're unique. Our boss is difficult. Our business is demanding. We're in an internet company. We're not. 
This is happening to all of us. We did a survey over the last couple of weeks, and we asked people these questions. And what we found was that effectively everyone we surveyed of the 200 respondents said they are online from the moment they wake up until the moment they go to bed. And this data overload, this, over, this avalanche of data, we asked people, how do you cope with it? And the number one answer, 78%, was, I just check my email constantly. I mean, you're checking it now, right? right. Um, the second answer was, I work weekends and evenings. A and the two answers that concerned me the most was the answer, I admit I just can't keep up, and I essentially sleep less. So I don't have a chart for this, but I'll tell you that 33% of the respondents said they check email in the middle of the night, so you're not alone. This phenomenon that there's this avalanche of information coming at us and that we're going to somehow manage it by just working harder or sleeping less is really a fallacy. We need to change the way we interact with information. And I'm going to give you some ideas about how to do that. But to begin with, we have to all acknowledge that the idea of consuming all the data on the web like a fire hose is simply not going to work. It worked for a period of time. It doesn't work now. So the first thing we have to do is really just say goodbye to search. And I want to just play an experiment out for you so you see how it works. I went and I did something we all do in the privacy of our own home. I Googled myself. <laughs> I admit it. Um, and here's what I found. Now, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to make this easy for you. I'm going to take, care, take away all the pictures of me. Now, that leaves a bunch of guys also named Steve Rosenbaum. Fair enough, I'll give Google that. I understand. But it also leaves a bunch of women. <laughs> and, and maybe the one that troubles me the most, <laughs> which is this one. <laughs> I just don't know how you confuse me with a Pomeranian. I don't understand. <laughs> now, this is funny. But it's also a little concerning. So if you're meeting me for a business meeting at the local Starbucks and you go online to figure out who I am, you go looking for a Pomeranian. <laughs> or if you're a sheriff trying to serve a warrant or a business partner, whatever it is, the idea that this information doesn't work is very troubling. Now, there are ways to make it work. And so what I want to do is talk about curation. And I'm going to give you a very specific example. So the new king of content is the king of curation. By the way, there are queens of curation as well. Um, I want to introduce you to one king of curation. I'm sure you all know Keith Urban, right? He's famous. You've all... I don't get that sense of, ah, we all know him. No, of course you don't. Keith Urban is someone you would never hear of. He has 1,000 followers. He's not very famous until he sent this tweet out last Sunday night. And when he sent this tweet out and said, Osama bin Laden has been killed, that tweet did something on the internet that was really dramatic, and I'm going to show you the data that comes from social flow. What's fascinating about this is that his single tweet single-handedly launched all of the tweets that sent this information around the web with his 1,000 followers. Now, why is that? Because he got it right? Because he was first? Because people understood that he, among other things, is you know, the chief of staff of Donald Rumsfeld now, and some number of his 1,000 followers knew that, so he had the authority and the knowledge and the authenticity to broadcast that information. By the way, the other big uh, data point on this is Brian Selter at the New York Times. What's interesting about those two bubbles is that Brian has 55,000 followers and the New York Times imprint, and Keith has 1,000 and was unknown. So what does this mean? How do we make this work for us? Well, the first thing is the world needs thoughtful filters. It needs us. Human beings increasingly are replacing algorithms, which is really powerful. And ideas, organized data, replace pure data. So now that you're the curator, all of you, I want to give you some thoughts about how you can curate information for your friends, your family, your customers, your clients. Three very simple takeaways that you can use. The first is, you all woke up, woke up this morning, and you put on a jacket and tie, or a pair of pants and a dress, or whatever you put on, and you looked in the mirror and said, this is who I'm going to be today. Increasingly, we're doing that same thing with digital information. So every one of us retweets things or posts things on Facebook or puts pictures on Flickr. Well, if you take a picture of your friend and it's not a flattering picture, you probably don't put it up. So you're curating. So think about the fact that all the information that you choose to share with your followers, whether you have 100 or 1,000 or 10,000, is you adding value into the new web ecosystem, the human network. The second thing is, Listening is more powerful than speaking. And what I mean by that is, I probably read or glance at 
400 tweets a day, 500 tweets a day. I retweet five of them. That filter, if I do my job right, is valuable to the people that follow me and understand the information I'm trying to find for them. So all of us should be absorbing more, filtering as much as we can, and then delivering some small portion of that out as the endorsed material. And then last but not least, this is brand new stuff, right? I mean, this is happening very fast. The volume of information on the web is growing. We all have to start by acknowledging we can't read every email, we're not gonna read every blog post, we're not gonna respond to everything. But at the end of the day, there are new tools coming online. They're very new. Start to play with them, start to experiment with them, and understand that at the end of the day, people will embrace clarity. And that's part of all of our jobs on this new network. So, three quick points. Choose your digital clothing carefully. Listening is more powerful than speaking. And at the end of the day, customers and partners embrace clarity. So, today we're all creators. This means that we all get to make things. It also means we all get to add noise to the system. We're not gonna make less. We're not gonna shut off the noise. So, begin to think about ourselves as creators and understand that. The web is becoming a human network. And that's an extraordinarily exciting idea. The fact that every one of us in this room today are nodes on this network and that we all get to make it better is really powerful. You know, there's an idea to turn all of this into a horse race and say, Facebook's gonna beat Google, Google's gonna beat LinkedIn, LinkedIn's gonna, it's not Facebook, it's not LinkedIn, it's not Google, it's not any of these things. In fact, very, very important to realize that it's us. Now, at the beginning of this talk, I promised you that this was a story about endings and beginnings. So, a week ago today, I found myself standing in the spot where I started to make my film 10 years ago. And, you know, I make a lot of content. I'm very busy. I'm a blogger and a writer and author. So, I expected this was going to be another thing that I would cover. But when I took this picture, I have to tell you that it was far more emotional than I expected it to be. And standing there at the site of the World Trade Center with the President of the United States and a wreath and no speech, no talk, no formality, just a very somber, quiet ceremony was really very important for me as all this noise tends to overwhelm us. So I took a couple pictures I want to share with you. The first one off to the right of where he was standing is the glassed-in enclosure to the steps that will lead down to the museum, underground, zero, seven stories down. Uh, and you'll see that in, inside that glass pavilion will be one of the tridents that held up the building. Extraordinary structure. These are the trees that are now growing. This is the plaza level at the Trade Center, which will open this fall. And in the background you see one world trade Really, uh, to be able to stand there and know that there is new life and that there are trees growing is really important. And then last but not least, wrapping around the pools will be the names of all of the victims in, brass, in, uh, in Boston, in, in Brass, and water that will be the largest moving waterfalls in the world pouring into these two empty voids. I've seen the water on, I've seen the pools running, it really is. Um, really quite extraordinary. And I, I just want to end by saying the stories that began 10 years ago brought me together with hundreds of filmmakers and storytellers, connected me with people I never would have met before, gave me the opportunity to join the lives of what became 28 storytellers, and I call them all filmmakers, but they were all individuals who held cameras in their hand. The fact that they shared that information with me and that I was able to knit that into a film was, for me, emotionally very important. And the fact that I was able to then share that with my children, and hopefully make my children's children, was the first time that I understood that the world going forward was about being a curator. So, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Enjoy curation, and enjoy TED. Thanks.